Uh, good evening, everyone, and good evening, our uh, friends and family online. We just want to welcome everyone again to tonight's uh, Bible study. We will appreciate uh, your dedication, your support, and uh, so that we can glean and learn together, which is beautiful always. Uh, the Word of God says how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. And there's no better place to build unity than at the feet of the Lord. When we break bread, the bread of the word, and even the physical bread together, and that is what we're doing every Wednesday, and we thank God for that opportunity. There are many in some other part of the world that would love to have this opportunity, but they don't. And so we do not take it for granted that the Lord has given us this opportunity to be together every Wednesday and every other uh, days of the week and the month. And so let's pray. Intelligent Holy Spirit, we bless you for being so kind and gracious to us. We thank you for the opportunity you've given us to come together, to learn together, to build each other up in, the, in our most holy faith through the help of the Holy Spirit. We cover the atmosphere with the blood of Jesus. We pray, Lord, intelligent Holy Spirit, you will speak life to us, encourage and strengthen our spirit tonight. And we pray, Lord, that every one of us here will bless and encourage to your word. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. And so I, uh, I just want to say something on the side before we get into the Bible study proper. Uh, this afternoon, while I was uh, preparing and getting ready, uh, I ran to the kitchen to start getting my stuff ready after Rita helped me and the mom to do the cutting, and I think Bernie was back and forth. And then suddenly, I just, I didn't even know, then I had to look for the song, but there was a song that just came to my spirit. And I believe it was, uh, I don't know if it was, I know a Nigerian artist sang it, but I don't know if the uh, is a hymn or something that it goes like this. Come see what the Lord has done, what we've been waiting for. Right? Is it a, a hymn? All right. See what the Lord has done. See what the Lord has done. What we've waiting for come to pass. See what the Lord has done. It's a chorus, but while I started singing that, you know, the and the voice came so what has the Lord done that you're singing? You know, and suddenly my the spirit of God in me just counteracted and it said, Don't even wait to see it before you know that it is done. And that goes for every one of us here tonight, whether you're listening at home, you know, and I began to sing it, and I sang it for about an hour, just going back and forth and just singing it off tune, but I didn't care. But it was just kind of a declaration. And I felt in my spirit to just share with us tonight that whatever you've been waiting for, and this is what the Lord was just placing in my heart, that what you've been waiting for has already been done, has already come to pass. I may not see it, but see it with the eyes of the Spirit. Maybe it's your healing you've been waiting for. Maybe it's a restoration you've been waiting for. But just begin to declare it that the Lord has already done it. And want us to believe it before we see it. Believe it before you see it. And that is what has just been so strong in my heart this evening. All afternoon till this evening. And I just want to encourage somebody tonight. That whatever you are expecting or believing God for. See that the Lord has done it begin to expect it, begin to act as if it happened, especially your healing, your restoration, reconciliation, victory in whatever capacity, the Lord has already done it. Amen. God has already done it. God has already done it. What we've been waiting for, and I know the song said, my eyes have seen, my ears have heard, and the Lord has done it. And I kept hearing in my ears, and what I was waiting for, what I'm looking forward to God doing in my life, I, I will stop and I start declaring it. And I want you to do the same. I want to encourage you. And don't expect to see a change before you believe that it's already happening. 
Amen. So that is what I just thought to encourage somebody with tonight. And uh, it's a word for me, but I just believe that somebody is for everyone that dared to believe God for themselves. Amen. All right. And so we go back to uh, continue with our Bible study, talking about new birth, a new life, a new creation in Christ Jesus. Uh, for some of us, it's just more like a refresher cause. For some, it is new. And for some, it is just a reminder of some truth that we already know. And the whole essence of Bible study is to equip us and so that we can be able ministers of the Lord in whatever capacity, maybe to share with other people. As the word is getting bleaker and darker, what the Bible says, let your light so shine. The, there's no better time than the time of darkness where light is needed. And so if there's gross darkness in the world like it is right now, then this is an opportunity for us as children of God to begin to shine forth our light. So this is our season in essence. Amen. This is our season. It takes darkness for you to appreciate light. And so this is not a season for you to feel uh, fearful or faint-hearted. This is the time and season for you as a child of the kingdom, truly born again, spirit-filled, to walk with your shoulder high and say, my time is now. This is our season. This is our season to let the world know that this, uh, the Bible said the earnest, the whole world is groaning in pain, waiting for the manifestations of the sons of God. This is that season. This is not a season for you to hide in fear, in panic. Do not fear what they fear. If we act in the same fear and anxiety and panic like the whole world, then we've lost the essence of who we are. This is our time. The end time is your time. It's not a time to be afraid. It is time to be filled with the joy of the Holy Spirit like never before. Amen. And this is why we are reading and studying this tonight. And those of us who already, uh, if you miss it, keep your notes and go back to the previous <laughs> lessons. Uh, tonight, I just kind of a recap, and then we will conclude on the new bed before we go to justification, God willing. Um, early this morning, I, I wanted to make this as a footnote to the main note, but as I came to the office, it just like... God has a way of pulling a fast one on you sometimes. And today, I, when I was getting ready to leave the house this morning, I, made a, I was thinking aloud, so I made a comment to Esther. And I said, the living cannot serve the Lord. <laughs> right? I said, it takes the dead to really be a Christian. That was what I thought. She started laughing. But I thought about it, and I, and I left that thought because it was so heavy in my heart that for you to really serve the Holy Spirit, to serve God in truth and in spirit, you cannot be alive to do that. Honestly, you can't. It is practically impossible. This flesh must die for you to be able to live out your God-given life on earth here. And it just dawned on me this morning and said, son, you played. You can't be alive to serve in truth and in spirit. And this is what I meant by that. Let's look at our scripture. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified, Romans chapter 6 verse 6, if you're online with us, Romans chapter 6 verse 6 says, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should no longer serve sin. This is what I mean by dying, crucified. And we know the story of uh, crucifixion. When Jesus went on the cross and was crucified, what happened? He died. Right? It was brutal, it was hard, it was tough, it was embarrassing, but he had to die for him to live. And this is why he said, unless a corn of wheat fall to the ground, it abides alone. But if it dies, it will bring forth much fruit. It is in our dying that we produce fruit unto righteousness. 
And as children of God, in these last days, if we really want to shine forth, then literally we must lay down. I'm going to just go ahead of myself back and forth here. You know, Paul says something, and I just kept thinking about it all day today. And uh, looking back to all our previous notes and all that, Paul said, I die daily. So the death of yesterday cannot sustain me today. <laughs> it's a daily walk with Jesus. And these are some of the things that we are not taught, we are not told, we are not reminded of as Christians. Because when we get saved, all they let you and me know is that give your life to Jesus and it's going to be a Disney life experience after that. <laughs> Amen. Oh, are you in trouble? Come to Jesus and all your trouble will be over. This is how we campaign. Right? And we became, we've, been, we've, been, we've been miserable salesmen to Jesus. Oh, come to Jesus and all your problem will be over. Yeah, it's true in part, but that's not the whole truth. Amen. So another word for new bed means debt to self. Look at our note. Debt to self, debt to my old way of thinking and doing things. My selfish interest must give way to his interest alone. And that is hard. It is hard. It is easier said than done. Amen. It's easy to say this, but putting it into practice when the rubber meets the road, when I'm confronted with a basic, basic, minute things. You are driving on the traffic on the highway and somebody just caught you. <laughs> right? It takes the grace of God not to lash out because impossibly you want to like, ah, <laughs> right? Just simple things like that. Because what we're talking about here is not, like I said, it's not the obvious saying, uh, oh, it's not going to be easy for you to lie. It's not going to be easy for you to commit adultery. It's not going to be easy for you to cheat. It's not going to be easy for you to kill somebody. And some of us, we're already morally grounded that some of we will never be caught dead doing that. But the little foxes, right? John said something. He said, I must decrease for him to increase in me and show me. You know, John speaking, he said, he must increase and must decrease. And this is dying to self. When you give your life, the new birth simply means I decrease him. The whole essence of me, everything that I hold dearly begin to pale in comparison to him. Amen. New birth is a crucified life, a life of daily dying and staying dead. The stench of our life is what is called foolishness in the eyes of the world and carnal Christians. Because the dead stink. Uh, right? Death is not pretty. Let's look at it. And, and I realize that when you die, after a while, you begin to decompose. It's not a pretty sight. And Paul said we have become what? A garbage dump, a refuse dump. We're like a stench to the world. And I was wondering, and until today, it really dawned on me, and I understood to a, a, in part what he meant. Because when, it, when you act true Christian lifestyle, People will see you as a fool. And people literally walk all over you as a child of God. And people will take you for granted. <laughs> they will disdain you. And this is the stench of the dead. And so other people will look at you and say, how can you be so foolish? How can you be so weak? How can you not retaliate? How do you bless those who curse you? 
How does somebody ask you to go one mile and you go ten miles with them? In the eyes of the world, it's foolishness. And they look at you, you stink. And even to a carnal Christian, they see you in the same light. But this is what the new birth is. This is what the new life in Christ. Jesus said, unless a corn of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it will bring forth much fruit. It is in our dying that the new life of Christ, the new birth, is made manifest. And so this is where I put my word. In other words, the living cannot serve God. It's hard. And it was so strong in me to the Lord. You know, you know like we just, you keep preparing something and you keep going. And, and, and every day comes and the Holy Spirit just, it, 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 it doesn't just want you to just have head knowledge, head information. He brings practical situation around you to put it to test. And I believe that most of us, if you have been watching closely, maybe since we started this Bible study, there, there would have been issues that they have come to kind of test your knowledge of what you've been studying. First Corinthians chapter 15 verse 31. I protest by your rejoicing which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord for I die daily. This is Paul speaking. I die daily. Every day. I wake up <laughs> before he steps out of the house he has to crucify himself. Because to function in this fallen, broken, battered world with my flesh, my ego, my pride, my right intact will be very difficult. But I believe that in doing that, this is where the aroma, the sweet aroma of the grace and the love and the power of God is released. And this is what the world is looking for and they don't have. And only in Christ can we find that? So the new birth can only happen when the old life is dead and buried. There can be no new life until we get rid of the old life. Listen to what Paul says in Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I. But Christ liveth in me. If Christ is living in me, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus Christ? Does Jesus have, does Jesus hate? Does Jesus gossip? Does Jesus fight for his right? Even when he was nailed to the cross. If Christ is living in me and living through me, how much of Christ is seen in my actions, in my words? When the rubber meets the road. Amen. Amen. Any question or comment? When you hear your documents, when you actually watch them, it's not easy to be a Christian. <laughs> 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 Just out of the blue. It's not easy to be a Christian. <laughs> I know. It's hard. Uh, it can be hard. Uh, it takes the grace of God to serve God. Right. It's not, it's not, it's not as, because we make it so, it's fun, it's sweet, but it's not a walk in the park. In my mind, I liken it to when the salmon go upstream to spawn. Mm -hmm. 
on. Right. They're going against every current in that. That's area. right. And when they get to the place where they lay their eggs, they die. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I think I, I, you describe it, that is a perfect description, illustration. And that is the life of a Christian, a true Christian. Because you are, yeah, go ahead. Right. Right. That is the joy, and that is what that is what the dead comes in. Because the, the truth is, uh, as hard as he feels or looks, there is so much joy. Because the other flip side of the dead man is that you cannot hurt a dead man. Right. There's nothing you do to a dead man that it will affect him. The dead man does not have his right to protect. The dead man, you cannot slander a dead man. You cannot gossip a dead person. They don't feel it. That's what I'm saying. He doesn't care about it. <laughs> He's not bothered. He doesn't even hear. He doesn't even know. He's just there. So that's where he has rest and peace. And, you know, I, 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 and I think when I, the more I think about this, as I meditate so quickly in my spirit, sometimes they happen, and then scriptures begin to come to me, and I begin to understand them differently. You know, like Isaiah 26, 3, he will keep in perfect peace, just like our sister said here, whose mind is stayed on him because he trusts in me. Keep in perfect peace because and it takes that stillness. To experience the peace of God that passes every man's understanding. Jesus said, what in this world? At first, as a young Christian, I couldn't reconcile that statement. I didn't come to you to have tribulation. You know? He said, in this world, you shall what? You will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Right. Peace gives you power. Because peace means that you are not moved. Perfect peace. Cast away all. <laughs> right. You know, being peace means, you know, peace is not the absence of war, like they say, or absence of crisis. Peace is the presence of God in the midst of your crisis. So you are so stable. Unmovable, the Bible says, because none of those things move you. So people are just, you know, because this a peaceful Christian is a stable Christian, is a calm Christian, is a dead Christian. He doesn't throw, that, that means I cannot throw tantrum. Because tantrum is a function of restlessness. Is emotion that is not stable, that is not calm. It's unstable spirit that lashes out. It's a very fine line between being dead in, in Christ, but still being uh, a, a, a earthly good. Right, right. Like, let's face it, a father is supposed to provide for his if, if good people never speak up, then our world goes to hell. Right. That's so true. It's, it's an extremely fine line as to... Yeah, right. But I think that's where you, you, speak, you speak the truth from a place of calmness, not from a place of anger, not a place of aggression. And then you can be, uh, like I used to tell my boys, I said, when they talk, to, tell them you respectably disagree. <laughs> you, you, you know what I mean? And you can speak the, your truth. The Bible says speaking the truth in love. Right? There's a way you will, I will speak to you uh, in love and you will feel corrected. And there's another way, again, I can speak to you that 
undermine and put you down. Even though what I'm saying to you is right, but the way I come across to you, you are going to react differently. Right? And I think this is where the, the, the Spirit of God, the peace of God comes in. And this is where the, the dead, like Paul says here, nevertheless, I, I, let me, let's look at Galatians chapter 2 again in our hand at verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. The life I live now, I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself to me. So living that life through Christ, the Bible says speaking the truth in love, we can speak and correct in love, we can rebuke in love. Uh, let me give you another good example uh, from the Bible. Uh, John chapter 4, you remember the story of the woman with the issue of blood? I uh, know. The Samaritan woman by the well. She was a bad woman, right? A woman about town. You can just say, in our today's word, you can call her a very loose woman in the community that would have a very bad name. And people would have been talking behind her back, some people harassing her, calling her all sorts of names. Now, when she met Jesus, Jesus didn't say anything new to her. Jesus didn't tell her anything that she didn't already know about herself. But the way he spoke to her, she didn't feel condemned. She felt convicted. And this is where the, the spirit of peace comes in. The spirit of peace walking through the dead Christian will correct, will create an atmosphere of conviction, not condemnation. And, and what, you, what you say there is true because the, the, the fine line is that we think that being dead means being a dummy. No, it just simply means you are so actively alive in Christ that the fruit of righteousness that comes out of you through the power of the love of God, right? You become attractive. And also you become more of a threat, just like Jesus was physically. What they could not, the, the, the Pharisees and the religious leaders of his days could not stand him because his presence, without saying anything, convicted them. You know what I mean? And this is what a true child of God does. You know, a lot of people, they come around you and you don't have to say anything to them and they say you're judging them. Have you ever experienced that? Yes. The people stay around you and they begin to say they feel judged. You don't have to say a word. Because if you're living out the truth, you don't have to carry the Bible in your head. You don't have to go around quoting John 3, 16. You become a living epistle, read of men. Remember what Jesus said. Unless a corn of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, he will bring much forth fruit. So the dead in Christ is living through Christ, bearing fruit unto righteousness that becomes very, very attractive to the world around it. You are attractive and they feel convicted. And there is nothing they can do about it. And so all they, either they get convicted and change, or they get feel condemned and run away. But you as a child of God need to be a projection of the glory and the light of God in truth and in spirit.
be a voice that people pay attention to. Right. And that is the the, 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 the the underlying key there is speaking the truth in love. Speaking the truth in love. We is speaking the truth in love. And, 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 and the power of love. You know, love is such a powerful tool. If love is the only thing I believe that on earth that God has given us that the enemy cannot fake. Because God is love. <laughs> right? And so if you speak the truth to me from the platform of love, I will be convicted. I will be convicted. I may not agree with you, but I will be convicted. And, and, and this is the same thing too that when you are around your friends, like in your workplace, if you're really living out your life, you don't have to say anything. There are certain things they will not do when you are around. That is you speaking. That is you speaking. When, when you are around, you should be in a place long enough that your fruit and your light should shine. That without you saying a word, that when they come around you, there are certain things they want to do, they become uncomfortable. That is you speaking. <laughs> They say, oh, he's here. You he can't do that. You can't say such a thing. You can't go this way. We can't do this. I found that, you know, we're kind of like a get out of the front here. Shut down. I never preached to anybody. I, you know, it was quiet. But the guys would start apologizing. The customers around me was like, well, how will they know? Right. You know? Yeah. So it, it's obviously spirit. It's discernment. Right. Because your life, because what happened is that, it, 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 you know, Paul says to some we are the aroma of death and to some we are the aroma of life. <laughs> to the convicted, what blows out of your foolishness is life. And to the one who is condemned, what comes out of you, what projects out of you is foolishness. And this is where it becomes very dicey. And Jesus, you know, because it, it, it's an expression, like we say, speaking the truth in love. Love is the powerful weapon. Again, only the dead can love the way Jesus, right? He said, he said, a new command I give unto you. Love one another as I have loved you. How did he love us? He died for us. That is strong. Can I really die for you? Can I love you to an extent? Truly. But it's not just talking about just literally taking a bullet from me. It's talking about me being able to give up my right just for you. Talking about letting what I want so desperately because we both want the same thing. We are both thirsty. We both want the same water. We both have the right to this water and I'm willing to let it go because of love. There is a story, uh, this book, uh, what, what is it called? Where is that? This guy... Whether he gave, uh, whether it was a true story, I can't remember. I can't remember this book, uh, the book now. But there was this story in the, this book about two homeless people in New York. Right? I don't know how true that is, but it was uh, a story in a book I read. I, uh, what's this book? It was written by Rick Joyner. I can't remember the book now. But this is another true story. Yeah, th that was the story in the book. But he gave this story that he saw this homeless person in heaven in a vision or in a dream. And when he saw the man in heaven, he remembered where he had met him before. And he remembered that he met him, uh, he was one of the homeless people in the subway in New York, not living uh, outside. And uh, he wondered how he died. And while he was looking at him, asking that same question, the Lord showed him how the man died. 
that it was in the thick of the winter and this homeless man and his uh, neighbor, his fellow homeless uh, fellow, they were all very cold, right? And his friend was almost freezing to death. And this other guy, unconsciously, without even thinking about himself, took out all his coat and everything to cover his friend. They were both homeless, cold outside. And in trying to protect his friend from freezing to death, he froze to death. Right? He didn't think twice. And so this is how he, the man ended up in heaven. And he saw him. And so it apparently meant that even though this person was homeless, he knew the Lord. He knew what it means to die to self. He knew what it means to forsake his own right so that others can have. Right? Again, I keep putting it. The living cannot serve the Lord. No one should seek, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 24. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. My neighbor is not race, class, or even religious uh, specific. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping one commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Putting the interest and the well-being of others above my own is only possible when I'm dead to self, like this homeless man. And this is where our, our, our faith as new Christians, truly convicted in the Lord, is being tested in relation to my neighbor, to my friend, to my wife, to my children. To my neighbor that does not know Jesus, that doesn't go to church like me, that doesn't believe like I believe, that does not look like me physically or otherwise, they don't dress like I dress, they don't live where I live, they don't look like me. And this is where the, 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 the end time of reviver is going to ride on the wings of the love of Christ. And not just love that we pedal with our mouth, the love that's going to be tested over little things. Not big things. Right? Not the big things. I realize that and I, and I keep finding out uh, as the more I studied this, uh, since we started this a few months ago, the more I kept studying the new birth and going back again. And I realized, like I said in the church a few weeks ago, it's not going to be the big thing. I realized that it's not a big thing that is going to fall me. It's not a big thing that I'm going to be guilty of. Right? Helping the poor generally and, and supporting uh, a widow in Africa, it's not, it's not going to be that. It's not going to be oh, helping children everywhere. It's not going to be that big thing. It's going to be somebody drunk coming into the church on one, one Tuesday afternoon that I'm sitting out here and my defenses is going to go up right away. Okay, what is it? What do they want? Why should I help them? Just little things. It could be. Because the big ones that have overcome that, the Lord may bring a little thing. Could be one of those children coming here on Wednesday that will get on my nerves. It just could be. It could be one fellow church member. Right? Over little things. And then suddenly I will see whether I'm still alive or dead. My neighbor. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Let nothing be done through strive or vain glory. But in lowliness of mind, let us each esteem each other better than ourselves. It means when I don't have my way, I will still work in love and not sulk. 
You know how little children, and you know, we before I had, uh, before I became a parent, uh, before I became a father, you know, you have this, you know, you have this know-it-all attitude like you're a superman. Like when I see children misbehaving in the mall with their parents or their mom or in the store and the child is just going, yeah, 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 yeah. You're like, man, keep that child in a leash. You know what I mean? But the moment you become a parent and you realize that it's not as easy. <laughs> it's easier said than done. But mostly what happens to kids like that? Why does the child begin to go out of work? Because he cannot have his way. He wanted candy and maybe grandma says, no, not now. And then suddenly he's jumping around and creating a, drawing attention to the whole store. And you will have to give in because you don't want the child to what? <laughs> to embarrass you. And sometimes most Christians, most of us are like that. So, when things don't go the way we want, do we throw spiritual tantrum? Do we get angry with God? Right? Oh, I prayed and God didn't answer my prayer, so I'm not going to go to church again. <laughs> I wanted that and God gave it to this person instead, so I'm not going to go again. I'm angry with God now and I'm angry with everybody. You know, do we throw spiritual tantrum when do we not have our way with God or with man? Or is our flesh dead? So new birth also means to be crucified with Christ. It means we are new creation in Christ Jesus. We looked at that last week looking at... Uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If any man be in Christ, behold, is a new creature. All things have passed away. And behold, all things have become new. Right? It means that which has never existed before. And this is very interesting. I, uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 is important for you to memorize that. Not just memorize it, but meditate on it. If any man be in Christ, behold, is a new creature, a new species, a new specimen, that which has never existed before. You are completely brand new. That means... You died and you were resurrected. And this is what baptism is all about. Baptism actually, in a way, the way I look at baptism, baptism is just our funeral. Literally, spiritually speaking. Baptism is a funeral service for you and me. Because where you get, when you get baptized, is just symbolizing the new birth. It's just a symbol. It's a schoolmaster to teach the word that here lies. So everywhere where you were baptized should be your cenotaph. And say, this is where he was buried. This is where this old man died and was buried. And, and this is where also a new one was given birth to. So the old man died, was buried and forgotten. And the new completely, so the new birth is not makeover. It's a complete rebranding, a brand new man. It's not makeup. It's not renovation. It is total transformation. A new person was given out by the agent of the Holy Spirit. And then we have to keep in step with that. And we have to keep reminding ourselves on a daily basis that who I was yesterday is no longer the same person. And so we cannot begin to allow the old nature that was buried, right? We just keep assuming the old man every now and then. And the enemy has a shovel in our hand. You know what I mean? Some of us we buried it and we had the shovel in our hand. And every little thing, we just pull it out. 
and they bury it again and bury it again. So our whole body is decapitated, literally speaking. Amen. <laughs> So when the old man is, is dead and gone, we are now to walk in the newness of life. New means we are free from pride, arrogance, selfishness, and self-interest. Romans chapter 6 verse 4 says, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism unto death, that like as Christ Jesus was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in the newness of what? Life. Right? We died. We were buried like Jesus. But we came out now to begin to walk what? In the newness of life. I'm a brand new man. Oh, things are passed away. I'm born again. More than a conqueror. That's who I am. I'm a new creation. I'm a brand new man, I'm a brand new man, I'm a brand new man. Who oh, things are passed away. Literally. Right? New birth means to be crucified with Christ. It also means we have new love, new order, new Lord, a new love in our heart flowing. The lust of the flesh and the love of the things of this world have been crucified when we died. In Galatians chapter 5 verse 24 said, They that are in Christ have crucified the flesh with the affection and its lust. Crucified. 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 And, and I want to encourage us. Uh, in, in moving forward, if you've done it before, do it again. Try to Make it a point of duty with all your devotion and your Bible study. Try, start with one Paul's epistles and begin to read through again. Begin to read through again. Read it now like a student. Begin to read it. Just take it. Take one, take one letter of Paul. Maybe go back to, take Colossians, take Galatians. Take Ephesians, take Corinthians, take Romans, take any of the letters and begin to go through it. Jesus, I believe, this is my understanding, like how some will believe. Jesus came and gave us the foundation called the church. But he gave Paul the apostle the mandate of putting all the structures of what is called the church to get together. And when you begin to read Paul's letter, you begin to have a deeper understanding of what it truly means to be a Christian and a new creation in Christ Jesus. And I know as a young believer, one thing that came to me when I really began to study Paul, the first thing that came to me was, man, this guy is proud. When I read Paul's letter on my own, from my own physical mind, when I started reading, and I said, this man is proud. How can... But then... The more I began to study, and I began to understand where he says knowledge, because when you get to know Christ, and it is possible through the Holy Spirit, you walk in such freedom and liberty, and you are not afraid to be called a doormat. You are not afraid to die daily. You are not afraid to be crucified on a daily basis. You are not afraid to say, this word, there is nothing in it for me. You live as if Jesus is coming any second now, but you plan as if he's coming in the next hundred years. And this is where the wisdom of the Holy Spirit comes. You live ready with excitement. Your kingdom work is, is full of excitement. This is where Paul can say, what shall separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus? Is it death? Is it pain? Is it sorrow? Is it poverty? The things that make me and you throw tantrum at God. <coughs> Poverty, pain, death. He said, none of those things, none of those things matter. And I like, Lord, help me. Personally on a daily basis. Amen. So now... Oh, 
what did I write here? Now we love Christ, though we have not seen. Right. And so when, when the new love comes, I'm just talking as if I'm speaking to myself, forgetting that I'm writing to. <laughs> and I, I expect you to understand. And now when you have this new life, now we love Christ, though we have not seen him, we love him in faith. Loving, you know, seeing Christ by faith. You know, Paul speaking, he said, the life I live now, I live by faith in Christ Jesus. Right? And so the work of faith, the life of faith, this is what I was trying to write here in differently. Living by faith, is, faith is not for me to believe God for cars and a good house and all that. That's part of it. But the, great, the real reason and need for faith is to be able to live like Jesus that I have not yet seen. Jesus said, blessed are those who have not seen, but believe, yet believe. Right? The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, it said Moses continued strong because he could see him that was invincible. Being able to live the life of faith, the life of pure love, the life that reflects the person of Jesus Christ, even though I have not yet seen him, yet I'm willing to be like him. So this is what I, uh, First Peter, it was First Peter chapter 1 verse 8 I was trying to explain there. So where whom having not seen, yet love, in whom though now you see him not yet, but believing and rejoicing with joy unspeakable and full of glory. That though we have not seen him, physically we have not seen Jesus. How many of you have seen Jesus physically? I have not. Right? And so, based I believe by faith through the scripture, and now try to mirror my life after him joyfully. This is what it means to die. Do you think 1 Corinthians 13, 12, this has always been a favorite scripture, Mike. Here on earth, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as I am also known. No. Amen. Because we only see dimly. Dimly. Right. Christ. Right. We will know more. When we see him. Yes. Amen. That's true. And that, that scripture is very right on that. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. Because we see dimly. And how do we see him dimly? Through the pages of the scripture. Yes. Yes. Right? We see dimly through the pages of the scripture. That's how he wants us to. How and then we mirror ourselves after that by faith. Yeah. We've not seen him physically. But we see dimly through the mirror of the scripture and then we mirror our life after what we have seen and we mirror it joyfully in faith. But the time will come when we will see him face to face. And that is what keeps us going. Amen. And that's why I love Bible study. You see, you let everybody just bring their own. Quickly, let me do this. New birth means we have new commitment. It means we are dedicated to the service of the glory of the Lord. And that dedication destroys selfishness and that ties us to the mundane things of this world. We, now, we are now willing or willingly take up our cross to follow him. And it is that, it is true that dimly, seen dimly, that we willingly take up our cross. We are not forced to take our cross. Nobody forces you. You are not compelled. The love of God is what compels me. Right? I deny myself. I choose to. I, I, I should not be forced to. I should not be manipulated to. I should not be threatened to. I should not be lied even to do that. I should not even be bribed to take up my cross. And we pastors do that. And we need to always ask for forgiveness. I personally, you know, you come and you make, oh, God is going to bless you. You know, which is true. Come to God. Give your life to Jesus and all your trouble will be over. Don't, I think we should be bold and courageous enough not to say that to people. Amen. 
to say, oh, just come, give your life to Jesus, and all that problem will go. Who are you to say that? And I say that, don't say that, because sometimes they come into Jesus and that begins the beginning of their birth pain. But if we can tell them that coming to Jesus means coming to die from day one, give your life to Jesus and exchange this miserable life for a life in Christ and peace undescribable. Beyond that, I don't have any answer to you right now. So, and I think in summary, as we pray, the whole thing is just kind of uh, same, the same thing in a way. But the last note there, the last word there, and the last scripture before we pray. The new man, new birth, is a function of complete transformation. Ephesians chapter 2, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22 to 24. I read as we pray. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self which is being corrupted by its what? Deceitful desires. To be made new in the attitude. I love the NIV translation. I put that because our attitude our attitude <laughs> Made new in the attitude of your mind to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. This is what the Christian life is all about. This is what it means to be born again. This is what it means because we cannot talk about, oh, there is therefore no condemnation to him that is in Christ Jesus. It doesn't mean because I come to church that scripture applies to me. Amen. Because I go to church every Sunday. No, no, no. There is no condemnation. The one who is justified is the one who is committed to die daily. And in these last days, as we pray, the whole world is groaning. The world is in chaos and is in confusion. Child of God, make it your mission to be a light of hope in your community, in your family. Be the answer to this dying world. You know, one of our favorite scriptures, I think me, uh, Sister Melody and I, we do that almost every December. Arise, shine, for your light is come. And I think that Isaiah is now. Your light is come. See, darkness Cover the earth, gross darkness over the people. But to you, the light of God has come upon you. And that light in you, there is no better time than now to let it shine. Whether you are in the hospital and the hospital bed, you can shine your light from there. Wherever you are going through, do not let your temporal circumstances dim that light of God in you. And that is what I'm praying for right now for myself. This is why I say it is not easy to be a Christian. It takes the dead to serve the Lord. Because there's going to be a different projection that is going to come. To try to dim that light. But I have to tell myself on a daily basis now. Lord, I'll die daily. Let your light shine through me. Let us pray. Eternal rock of ages. Lord, we know your word says anyone that was follow you must deny themselves, carry their cross, and follow you. Lord, it's easier said than done for us. Of our own, we cannot do it. Heavenly Father God, when we cannot, you can. Lord, I pray for every one of us, those of us here tonight and online. I pray, Lord, that you give us the grace of God to be a light in this dark world in the name of Jesus. Help us, O oh God, to be the true children that you have, that you will be proud of in the name of Jesus. 
We pray for the strength of the Holy Spirit to live right, to live holy, to live righteous for you in the name of Jesus. We pray for the strength of the Holy Spirit to keep us, O oh God, in the straight and narrow path in these last days in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray, Lord, that the joy of the Holy Spirit will be our strength in the days and season of great discouragement that may come upon us when we feel like joining the tower, when we feel like joining tantrum because you are too late in coming to our rescue. Heavenly Father God, may your grace and your spirit be sufficient for us. Father God, in your time of great agony, Lord, when you wept, O oh God, in Gethsemane, the angels came and strengthened you. In our own times of great weeping and great distress, Lord, I pray that we will not be alone in the name of Jesus. We pray that the comfort of the Holy Spirit will comfort and strengthen us. And again, O oh Lord, in this earth, O oh God, where you have kept us, O oh Lord, Lord, I pray, O oh God, if there be needs in our life, O oh God, that will make our race and our walk easy, I pray, Father God, that you will give us the strength, meet every one of us at the point of our need in the name of Jesus. May every Every promises that you've made unto your people that is yes and amen come to pass. May every sure word of prophecy spoken over every family, Lord, begin to find true expression in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, may that which you said you would do in our life, in the life of our children, in the life of our husband, in the life of our grandchildren, in the life of our wives, in the life of our parents, may they become a reality in our lifetime in the name of Jesus. For that we give you praise and we give you all the praise and we give you all the glory tonight. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. The Lord bless you all and thank you always for coming. Thank you our online uh, audience uh, from far and wide and near. We bless God for your life and uh, our service is here on Sunday, 11 o'clock in the morning. If you're in Grand Cash, you're welcome to join us. And if you are thinking of coming to the mountain town of Grand Cash for a weekend, just uh, give me a message and we will be willing and happy to host you for the weekend if you just want to see what uh, Cornerstone is like. Amen. God bless you and have a wonderful weekend. Amen. <laughs>